How is everybody this morning? Awake and ready. Awake and ready. That's the word. All right. Can't be sleepy and listen to these teachings. Our gurus have made sure that everything we do is with power so that when we assimilate these teachings, it's not just as Swami says, just this saccharine sweetness, ki kuch bhi ho rahe chalte ro. Kuch nahi hone wala hai, unless we allow it. And that is our great friend here, Shiva. That's who he is. Kuch nahi hoga unless I allow it. Shiva is a very interesting character in our pantheon. He's a being of lots of contradictions. He is completely in his spine. You know, nobody can move him. But then if he's moved, <laughs> he has tremendous power. Immediately, boom, destroy, khatam. He is a yogi, he is a renunciate, he's supposedly a celibate. But he's a householder. He's married, he has two kids. <laughs> he's like a lot, a lot of us here. Do bache bhi hai uske. Even Vishnu doesn't have kids. Unless he does, and I don't know of. <laughs> we are all his kids. But she was just very interesting because we think of him as, you know, just this far off removed thing. But he's actually more, more like us in many ways than we'd ever think. And he's simple. He does not live in Vaikunt and he does not live in luxury. He lives in the mountains, in caves, in complete simplicity. Even Parvati lives in simplicity with him. Just very, very much a renunciate at heart. Because he's a yogi. You know, Shiva was never actually a god in the beginning. The pantheon of Indian gods, you know, they evolve. And eventually, somewhere in there, they realized, yeah, this guy is pretty awesome. You know, let's bring him over to our side. Let's, let's give him a nice little cozy cushion position as part of the Trinity. But he was always a yogi and a renunciate. He ne was never God in that typical sense that we believe in. He's pleased so easily, yet he can't be pleased at all. That's his contradictory power. But his contradictions aren't where he is at war with his contradictions. He has integrated his contradictions. He's completely brought them into his spine where he chooses when and what, what is appropriate. At what time in my life, what action is appropriate. Bringing both those energies into the spine. And it's the same with the story of Mahashivratri. There are so many contradictory stories. You know, everywhere I look, somebody says it's because of this reason, somebody says it's because of that reason. And I, you can see it's people who want to make Shiva more like them. For the householders, Mahashivratri is about his wedding. For those who are seeking power worldly, it's about Shiva's dominance over uh, Vishnu and over Brahma. But for the yogi, and which is our, especially as a Kriya yogi, the story of Mahashivratri is the story of the churning of the oceans. Samudra Manthan. Do you know that story? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Did you say Aho? <laughs> <laughs> So in that story, for those of you who are already familiar with it or not so much, the Devas and the Asuras, as usual, what are they doing? Fighting. They're fighting. We, we know this story. We have this fight within us all the time. Our good qualities want to express themselves, but laziness and rudeness and unkindness and selfishness and everything wants to also take dominance within us. So there is this constant battle, this constant fight within us. The interesting thing about the Devas and the Asuras are that they are born of the same father. They have two different mothers, but they're born of, so they're brothers, essentially. They're family, just like we are. We're family within. Even our negative qualities are just as much part of us as our positive qualities are. But now what's happening in this particular case, the Devas are losing. So what does that mean? That 
our negative qualities are taking precedence. We're getting more easily angry, irritated, selfish, more self-dominating perhaps. And all that downward flow of energy within us. You see, we talk about the ups and downs of life. There are actually ups and downs within us. Because when the energy in the spine flows up, we experience these elevated, upward, joyful, positive qualities. And we can see it even in my body. If I just go up, if I inhale, anytime somebody tells me something that's joyful, I'll say... I'll just go up because there's this natural upward flow. And anytime, you know, something's not working out in the way we would like it to, the energy falls down. It's, a, it's an actual process taking place within us. This is the reactive process. I like this. I don't like this. This is good. This is bad. Great. Oh, no. And this is the reactive process of duality. It keeps us in duality. So essentially what's happening here is the story of the Devas and Asuras are a story of duality trying to play itself out. So kabhi Asuras jeetenge, to kabhi Devas jeetenge. Kabhi Dev will say, oh, oh, now everything is wonderful when good things happen in our life. I've just gotten promoted. The Devas are back. They're ruling now my kingdom. And I just got demoted <laughs> or fired or whatever, or the auto guy kind of, you know, sped past me in a way that I didn't appreciate it. The Asuras are in dominion now, have taken over. And this fight is going on all the time. Now, when the Samudra Manthan moment comes, now the Devas, you know, they're, they're a little down. The beauty of the Devas is that they draw their power from a higher source, whereas the Asuras don't. Therefore, you know, for a fact, eventually the Devas are always going to come on top. So you've got, they're wondering, how am I going to get through this? And Vishnu, of course, always the intermediary, says, look for the Amrit, look for immortality. And once you have that, you'll be stronger than the Devas, the Asuras. But in order to get to that Amrit, what do you need? You need the Asuras. <laughs> Just the, just the Devas were not churning the ocean. Both of them were churning the ocean. Because it's too big a job to do yourself just by one aspect of your being. It's too big a job. So you need to have both aspects of your being involved. But this doesn't mean that you have to have your negative qualities involved as well. Because here comes the yogic understanding especially for the kriya yogi because we in the practice of kriya what do we do we use the energy in the ida and the pingala in the ida energy rises up in the pingala energy rises down we use both the energies not just we're not thinking about ida mahi ghuster henge both the energies and we increase their power until both energies are neutralized because in god even positive qualities <laughs> are just qualities. They're still outward. They're still dual. They will never become singular in the divine. So here the Samudra Manthan takes place. They get this mountain called Mandhara. Very appropriate name. Man, the mind. Dhara, hold firmly. Mind held firmly in meditation. Deeply concentrated. That's the mountain, the spine. Then you've got, they bring in Vasuki, who is the snake. And the snake acts as the rope for the churning. Makhan banaya kabhi kisi I guess nowadays we don't need to do that stuff. But I remember when I was, used to go to my grandmother's village and she would make butter for us and she'd churn the milk for the butter. And similarly, the rope acts as that churning. Now, of course, the snake represents the Kundalini. But the two aspects of outward aspects of the Kundalini are the Ida and the Pingala. And on one side, you've got the Devas pulling. On the other side, you've got the Asuras pulling. So the energy rises up when the Devas pull. The energy descends down when the Asuras pull. And this process needs to take place in Kriya very powerfully. You know how long they were, they were at the Manthan? Thousand years, it says. So, I mean, okay, nikla. A thousand years, these guys were doing nothing but heaving and hoeing on a snake 
wrapped around a mountain. I mean, it makes no sense <laughs> until you realize it makes perfect sense inside me. Because we go through this, we'll keep doing this. There's no end to it. We'll keep going up and down and up and down until finally we say, no more. And we take control of that reactive process. So what happens when this churning starts? So what does the ocean represent? Our consciousness. In meditation, we're churning our consciousness to see kya nikalta hai? Who am I? What's within me? Because we don't know. I mean, we don't know who we are. We think we're this, that, that, this, husband, wife, son, brother, mother, man, woman, Indian, Spanish, Dutch. I mean, what is this? These temporal realities, how long will we identify with them? Who are we? And we can't know who we are unless we don't churn the depths of our being. You won't be walking and Galti say you'll see a piece of paper and it'll tell you Kaun ho tum. Oh, achha, I'm God, okay. It's going to have to come from within you. So once this churning begins, lots of stuff starts coming out. What comes out? Who knows the story? We don't need to go through each of them because I probably don't remember either. But good stuff comes out. <coughs> Siddhis come out, sabse pehle to. Powers. And Vishnu had already told the devas, you don't go for those because you keep your eye on the ball. And so he did the asuras, because that's it. First and foremost, people who meditate want something from their meditation. I want this, I want that. And when we read the stories of the yogis, then though we really, I want to manifest the, you know, chintamani and I want to do this and I want to do that. I want to have complete control over this and over that, which is mostly over others. I want to be able to change my husband or my wife. To, I want to be able to change the situation. This is what outward power represents. And that's what comes out pehle. Aata hai, nikalta hai. But that's like the chindi. You know, that's like he, you don't want that at all. Because that's the trap. You can get caught up and then you can play this game all over again. Ludo ki tera snake upar ponchni wale saap last wala saap kha leta hai and it brings you all the way back down. Snakes and ladders. That final snake is the deadliest. Longest also. Yeah. Brings you pretty much back to square one. And that's, Yogananda said, also a big delusion on the spiritual path. That people come in hoping to gain power. But that goes. Aata hai, chala jata hai. Other things, lovely things come. Lakshmi comes. The wish fulfilling cow comes. Good stuff starts to come out. Everybody's super happy. Everybody's like, Mujhe chahiye, mujhe chahiye, mujhe chahiye. Vishnu takes Lakshmi away. <laughs> you know. All that stuff happens. And then what comes? Vish. Poison. Poison comes out from the churning of the ocean. And this poison is so strong, it's fumes. The moment it comes out, it's fumes threaten to just completely destroy the world. Devas, Asuras, all alike are coughing and, you know, not wanting to inhale these fumes. It's so powerful, this poison. What is this poison? Hamare andar poison hai? We have some poison. Something inside us, in fact, we have a lot of stuff inside us. And in the process of your churning, this stuff is going to come out. Have you ever meditated and got up and immediately gotten angry at the first person who has come to you? It happens because churning may sub acha acha nahi niklega, sub kuch niklega. Everything must be completely drawn out of this ocean of consciousness. And we think, oh, why am I getting angry? And you know, Abhi, in fact, now I feel more angry than when I started to meditate. <laughs> it happens, it's a temporary experience. I don't want to put people off meditation by saying that. <laughs> but that's what happens. Everything within us comes out. Our karma, our deepest, darkest, ugliest side, 
निकलेगा ही अंदर है तो निकलना ही पड़ेगा इट्स नॉट गोइंग टू जस्ट मैजिकली वैनिश एंड वॉट हैपन द मोमेंट दिस पॉइजन कम्स आउट एवरीबडी इज लाइक नहीं 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 चाहिए नहीं चाहिए दूर रखो मुझसे Our first thing is to reject. Our first thing is I don't want this karma. I don't want it to be hard. I only want to be this beautiful self of my meditation. I should be perfect and I should be smiling and I should be joyful all the time. But that wish is part of you. It's who you are. It's not. कहीं और से नहीं आया. It's not become some you know. कल्ती किसी ने गलती से डाल दिया while you were not looking. You very much were looking and you very much brought it in. So, but when this thing comes out, everyone's rejecting it. Devas and asuras alike. किसी को नहीं चाहिए. Which is an interesting thing. Who comes to the rescue? Shiva. Lord Shiva. Why can Shiva take that on him? Why is Shiva so joyfully so no big deal? Takes the poison and then stops it at his throat. Is the story Neil Kant? That is why he is. His throat becomes blue because of it. Because he can integrate contradictions. He does not reject one over the other. One's not better than the other. he can completely integrate it into himself and yet not be touched by it the poison didn't affect shiva he didn't become poisonous because of it he brought it in he held it because he has perfect control absolutely perfect control every aspect of shiva's being represents that we have his moon on his head the moon is the ego and in depictions when the moon is brought up to the sahasrara means the ego is completely merged there is no identity other than your identification with the infinite he's got the ganges flowing through him the story that the ganges was going to come and flood the earth and the only person who could stop its enormous power was shiva when he takes the ganges in his jata and he controls its power Now, of course, the Ganges represents. He was called Gangadhar because of it. The Ganges represents again that same inner flow of energy that has risen up to the top, but it can be chaotic, and it can be destructive if not channeled and if not controlled. In the even Shiva, we think Shiva is the destroyer, but he gave us Ganga, life-giving Ganga. he took the wish away from the world when the world could have been destroyed shiva could have been sitting ha 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 my job is done this wish is going to destroy the world but he is the preserver of the yogi he is not the preserver of the world of creation he is the preserver of the yogi and the destroyer of maya there are two very different distinct realities and it's important for us as we tune into shiva to feel that to tune in not to his destructive side alone but to tune into his empowering side for the yogi shiva empowers and in this shivaratri we want to tune into that and especially on a very very practical note we want to tune into this chakra this is where the wish was kya nikalta hai hamara wish our words our words are they say mightier than swords although pens they say are mightier than swords but i think words are more mighty <laughs> because they really cut they really hurt and we need to watch that wish here and what else is the fifth chakra the fifth chakra is the chakra of calmness It is a very powerful thing. हमको लगता है calmness मतलब बस बच्चों की तरह बस कुछ नहीं हो रहा है इतना पावर लगता है जस्ट टू बी काम पूछो नहीं एंड दिस इज हाउ शिवा वॉज एबल टू इंटीग्रेट द नेगेटिव थ्रू काम एक्सेप्टेंस दिस इज हु इट इज दिस इज वॉट देर इज आई जॉयफुली कामली एक्सेप्ट 
you take away the power of the poison if you already calmly accept it. It has no power over you anymore. And that is what Shivratri is about. Calmly accepting all aspects of your life which otherwise you would reject. And integrating them, learning from them, growing from them, and becoming like Shiva from them. Not after they are gone, but through their own power. They have an inherent power in themselves. So let's tune into that, not just Shiva hai, koi Mount Kailash mein betha hai. Tune into you as Shiva and what that means for you here especially. Now, how are you going to use your words? How are you going to use your poison to uplift, as the affirmation said, my power to transform myself and to awaken others? Any blessings? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so wonderful to hear about Shiva and stories and his powers and see this. But we not only want to hear stories about him, we want to really use the power of his consciousness to transform ourselves from within. And today especially, we can draw from that power and make a huge transformation inside us. And guess what? We are going to do that right now together. What we want to do is to bring out the poison from not only the fifth chakra, but from each one of the chakras. And that poison is, are the negative qualities and tendencies of each chakra. So what we are going to do now is to use the mantra Om Namah Shivaya to offer that poison, that negative quality that keeps bonding us into delusion and we want to offer that negative quality to Shiva so he can transform it, transmute it, purify it and substitute it by a positive quality. Okay? So what we are going to do, we are going to use the power of visualization and imagination. Everyone knows where the chakras are located. Okay, everyone knows, very good. The first chakra is at the base of the spine, at the very, very base. The second chakra is one inch and a half above the first chakra, the Swadhisthan. The third chakra is at the navel, Manipur chakra. The heart chakra is at the heart, at the chest. The fifth is the throat, Vishuddha. And then we'll go to the sixth, to the Shiva center. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to just mention one negative quality for, from that chakra and we are going to offer that to Shiva while chanting together this mantra. Om Namah Shivaya oh, Om Namah Shivaya Beautiful. Can you feel the vibration and the power that chanting that mantra brings? So what we are going to do, please close your eyes. I'm going to guide you into this visualization and I'm going to bring you, move you upward from each chakra and we'll be chanting together. I will guide you precisely. So you just relax and use the power of visualization. Close your eyes. Visualize the first chakra at the base of the spine, the Muladhara chakra. And bring Shiva's power into that chakra. 
Uh, one of the negative qualities of that chakra is when we become too stubborn in life and unwilling to change. So we want to give that unwillingness, that stubbornness, offering that to Shiva. So visualize that offering in the way you feel you want, with power at the first chakra. And while offering to Shiva that quality, that negative quality that needs to be transformed. Let's chant together in that offering to Shiva the mantra. One, two, three. Om Namah Shivaya. Let's move up to the second chakra, Swadhisthana. And let's visualize Shiva is still there now taking the indulgence of sensual pleasures. Yogananda said the sex is one of the greatest delusions. So we want to offer that energy that brings us always out into delusion. We want to withdraw to bring that energy within us and offering it up to Shiva so he can transform it into creativity, intuition, fluid, fluidity. So let's bring that energy of indulgence into Shiva's hands. And while we do that powerful offering, let's chant together. Om Namah Shivaya. Let's keep moving upward to the Manipur Chakra. The tendency that most of us are ready to give completely to Shiva, and that's anger and fear. Qualities that paralyze us in life or qualities that harm other people, we don't want them anymore in our lives. So we are very consciously offering those negative tendencies and putting at Shiva's feet because we are not going to bring with us anymore any of those tendencies from today onwards. So while you offer all your fears, your short temper, your anger, your frustration, at Shiva's feet, mentally, let's chant together with that powerful devotion and offering to Shiva. Om Namah Shivaya Let's move up to the heart chakra. This is a beautiful, powerful energy if we know how to use it kindly, lovingly. But the obstruction of attachments, of likes, and dislikes and emotions, strong emotions, prevent us from opening our hearts completely to life, to other people, to forgiveness. So if there is any strong attachment, desires, strong likes and dislikes, the time has come now to offer those attachments completely to Shiva so he can substitute them for kindness, compassion, unconditional love, acceptance. And when we are offering those attachments to Shiva, 
let's mentally chant with power together, fully getting rid of all those attachments. Om Namah Shivaya. Scan your body for a moment and feel the energy flowing freely upward from the first chakra up all the way now to the fifth chakra, Vishuddha chakra, the chakra of communication. And if there is a sense of restlessness, boredom, judgment, not be able to communicate clearly, truthfully, Let's offer those negative qualities to Shiva. In fact, visualize that your throat is Shiva's throat. And you are becoming bit by bit into the form of Shiva. And while you are offering from your throat to Shiva, the ability to communicate, to express yourself kindly, expansively, embracing and accepting everything around you. Let's offer to Shiva whatever you think is blocking you from expressing yourself, the truth that is within you. And when you do that offering mentally, let's chant together. Om Namah Shivaya. Feel the energy of your throat flowing freely, clearly, powerfully up to the sixth chakra, to the point between the eyebrows the true place where Shiva resides. And by now, we are not only using Shiva's power, Shiva's energy, we have become one with Shiva. So visualize that in the way you are sitting, Shiva is sitting in you. You and him are one and visualize all that energy that has been released from the first chakra all the way up to the point between the eyebrows to the Shiva Lingam. And at that point, offer yourself completely with humility, with devotion, with power. If it's still anything in your spine, any obstruction, any block, any stagnant energy, offer that consciously up at the point between the eyebrows while mentally chanting, invoking the presence of Shiva. Let's chant together. Om Namah Keep your attention at the point between the eyebrows. Let the power of Shiva still transforming your consciousness, aligning every molecule within you, in your conscious, subconscious, and superconscious mind. And now that you have become one with Shiva, now that you are representing that Shiva energy within you, we are going to chant three times Om Namah Shivaya at the point between the eyebrows and visualize that from that point you are emanating that power, those purified qualities that have become one with you, one with the Shiva within you and share 
those qualities into the world from your point between the eyebrows. So let's chant together three times Om Namah Shivaya from the point between the eyebrows. Om Namah Shivaya.